Mark, I appreciate it. And, um, it is hard to get through foot and ankle, maybe anything uh, this time of day, but we're the, uh, you know, the foot's the part that holds the rest of this course up and supports it. The, uh, we have a uh, fellow uh, this year, uh, wonderful young man, Bobby Erden, from a uh, little old tiny town in North Carolina. And when he heard I was coming to do this, he says, Dr. Richardson, uh, don't you teach them a thing. They've been taught for five years and they're tired of it. You just tell them which button to push. So what, what, I, uh, uh, what I did was <clears throat> we took 269 questions from five years of OITEs and uh, part of that, 200 questions of that from self-assessment examinations over a five-year period, two separate examinations. And then I took them and uh, tried to condense them to uh, themes and recurrent questions. So like uh, Dr. McPherson said, there, there's, uh, believe it or not, not compared to total joints, but in foot and ankle, there's a world of information out there in the last, oh, 10 years plus for sure that we could have added to this course. But that, what we want to do is just to have you uh, end up uh, the day you get your scores back and you say, well... I did okay in foot and ankle. That's what Dr. Miller uh, wants you to do, and of course that's what I want you to do. And I told Dr. Miller, my son took this exam last year, the board exam, and he said, remember this, Pops, if they open that scorebook and they did all right on foot and ankle, they'll never remember your name. But if they didn't do well, they'll never forget it. <laughs> that's from your own son. You know, it makes you feel good about yourself. The... Um, I'll stop off and on and look down at, at my notes a little bit because I've added a few little things um, that I don't, they just came to me later that I don't want you to miss. So hold on, we'll, we'll get through this together. If you look down at the foot and ankle section, about, oh, six or seven percent of the questions will be on that. And I sure don't want you to miss any gimmies. So I'm going to try my best not to let you do that. If you're, everything I say, that's not quite true, but you go on and think, everything I say has been in a question phrased in some way or another, because that's where all this talk comes from. Stance phase of gait, 65% uh, or so, swing phase, 35%. That's roughly. The, um, right here at uh, heel stripe, the heel is in varus. Uh, foot flat from here over to mid stance phase. The mid tarsal joints unlock. The tarsal metatarsal joints unlock at um, end of terminal stance phase toward uh, this area and then toe off. The mid tarsal joints are locked for stability. And remember this: at toe off, eight tenths percent of body weight is focused at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. But if you let a lady get in a two-inch heel, because that eight-tenths is barefoot, it goes to 1.6 times body weight. So double the body weight, a two-inch heel, terminal stance phase, toe-off gait. They don't ask too much about uh, pure joint motion. Uh, you need to know that there's more um, inversion than eversion, more adduction than abduction, but they do ask combinations of motion. I think if you'll just lock in your mind that pronation, and I'm going to show you a slide that demonstrates that when we get over to the posterior tibial tendon insufficiency, dorsiflexion of the ankle, eversion of subtalar joint, abduction, transverse tarsal joint, and if you get that in your mind, you know that supination is the opposite, so you don't have to, to memorize both of them. They like to ask this, the TA contracts uh, eccentrically at heel strike, Gastroc quiet. Gastroc contracts concentrically at heel rise and push off, eccentrically at foot flat. They like that for some reason. Now, the windless mechanism in some form or fashion is going to be on there, and they're going to bring in, of course, the plantar fascia into that mechanism. The uh, origin insertion of the plantar fascia, and it is, listen to me, a major support of the medial longitudinal arch, but it's not the major support. 
the major support is the capsulo ligamentous, particularly plantar, structures that support the mid-tarsal and intercaneoform joints, particularly in the medial and central columns. But what they want to know is that uh, what they're asking you here is the windless mechanism is very important, so don't tamper with the plantar fascia unless you've got a good reason. It's the second most important support. The third is the dynamic support of the posterior tibial muscle. And finally, the last is joint congruity uh, and alignment. That's the least uh, support for the medial longitudinal arch and for obvious reasons. Now, they like this one. They particularly like layer two and three, and they like to, to uh, get you on where the neurovascular bundles traverse, between which two intrinsic muscle layers do the neurovascular bundles traverse. So get that in your mind before the, uh, before the test. Now, the uh, sural nerve, most vulnerable with that uh, big extensile lateral uh, approach for the calcaneus that the Seattle boys love. Lateral calcaneal branch is most likely to be injured if you're uh, doing a calcaneal sliding osteotomy, you know, for posterior tib insufficiency and you're trying to get rid of some of that heel valgus. It's the century to the dorsal fourth web space, and what I didn't put in there is 70 to 80 percent of the time. It's not categorically the sensation to the dorsal uh, first web. And um, <clears throat> it's particularly vulnerable when you're repairing the Achilles tendon in the proximal part of your, part of your wound up near the musculotendinous junction. Sural nerve particularly vulnerable and particularly vulnerable with the percutaneous technique. They like that one too. Uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Um, Miller will probably hit on that in the sports medicine section. I'm trying to read and think too up here. Now the uh, deep perineal nerve, um, you know that nerve that it just is, it, it dives beneath the medial edge of the EDB and EHB on its way across to the sinus tarsi. It's vulnerable with removing of the CN bar, innervates those muscles, compressed beneath the inferior retinaculum, in anterior tarsal tunnel syndrome. I'm going to get to that a little bit later. It's injured during an approach for reduction of Lisfranc frank injury. That might be on there too. Superficial perineal nerve, the dorsal medial aspect of the hallux. You know, when you're doing a bunion, you've got to protect that one. I don't know how many times I've cut it, but it's been a whole bunch. Lateral cutaneous, but you don't want to cut it on the exam. Lateral cutaneous branch, most vulnerable with arthroscopic anterior lateral porter and during ORF of the distal fibular fracture, particularly a Weber C. They like to throw that in there. You've got to know the boundaries of your portals, like anterolateral, fibular lateral, and perineus tertius medial. Just know your portals and know, make sure you don't go through that central portal. They don't like that one because that's, uh, you can damage some things you don't want to damage. The nerve, the superficial perineal nerve, emerges from the deep fascia, 12 to 15 centimeters proximal to the tip of the lateral malleolus, can be stretched during an ankle sprain. They'll give you an ankle uh, sprain patient. They just won't get well. Neuritis, neuralgia. Well, it's a traction injury at the superficial perineal nerve. Might even get uh, uh, RSD. Uh, the lateral plantar nerve is the motor nerve to the adductor hallucis is a branch of the lateral plantar nerve. What I think you ought to do here is only memorize what the medial plantar nerve innervates. The abductor uh, uh, hallucis, the FHB, flexus torn brevis, and lumbricals one and two are to the second and third toes. They're not going to mess you up the fact that the second lumbrical is durally innervated, not infrequently. They'll just tell you that those three uh, muscles plus two of the lumbricals, one or two of the lumbricals. Then the others are all lateral plantar nerve. Um, you need to know this about the abductor hallucis. Um, the proximal third of the muscle is where the innervation is. It's why you can be fairly cavalier mobilizing that muscle to get where you want to go with compartment syndromes or to release the distal part of a, trend of a tarsal tunnel release. You can be uh, you know, you can go at it pretty hard because the, there are two branches and they're all in the proximal third. Uh, you must be partially mobilized for adequate distal tarsal tunnel release, the deep fascia partially released uh, in size to release Baxter's nerve, which is the first branch of the lateral uh, plantar nerve. Um, 
those are the, the things below that, the decompressed deep planter space, et cetera. Just get those in your mind as to why you want to mobilize it. Um, those are the reasons. Now, the FHL tendon and muscle, it's most vulnerable. You know this. You've heard it since your second year of your residency, posterior medial corner subtalar joint during a subtalar fusion, or they'll say triple on the exam, closest to the distal Achilles tendon. Now, this has been in the last five years. can be harvested as a vascularized substitute transfer for severe, uh, for chronic severe insertional Achilles tendonitis. They use words like this uh, FHL lies below, deep, or dorsal to the FDL tendon at Henry's knot. Anterior tibial muscle tendon unit, um, not sure why they asked this in the foot and ankle section, but they very well might. Originates from Gertie's tubercle, innervated by the deep perineal nerve. Now, what they uh, are, are likely to come up with is a sudden onset of ankle dorsiflexion uh, weakness in an active elderly patient. They rupture the tendon at its insertion. And another thing you need to know about it is mononeuralgia diabetica with a drop foot. Spontaneous onset of a drop foot in a diabetic, probably an ischemic event. The posterior tibial muscle tendon unit, I'll show you a little bit later, but they love to ask. It inserts on every bone in the mid-tarsus and metatarsus except the, the first metatarsal. I'll repeat a little bit of this as we get to those sections just for emphasis. The uh, transverse metatarsal ligament holds the halical sesamoids in place as the first metatarsal head moves immediately. This is a false image of subluxation. Your sesamoids are not subluxing, it's the head. It's the structure on which the inter an interdigital neuroma is compressed when elevated heel uh, shoes are worn. All of these are questions. The deltoid ligament, anterior tibio tailor portion, I wish I'd made that red most commonly injured medial structure and recurrent sprains, most commonly injured medial structure, anterior tibio, anterior medial tibio tailor portion. The deep deltoid is a primary restraint to tailor subluxation in a lateral direction once the fibula is incompetent. The ATFL, primary ligamentous restraint to anterior subluxation, subluxation tibio tailor joint. But what they want you to what they probably are going to throw at you. And by the way, it's like Dr. McPherson said. This test will throw a few fastballs right down the center, maybe even a change up. But they're not going to throw sliders or those curves that hit the outside of the corner. They're going to be pretty straight on you. What they're going to do is ask you for sagittal drawer force with the ankle and 20 degrees of plantar flexion. That's how you test the competency of the ATFL, plantar flexion. And Bassett's ligament, I don't know why they keep hammering this. Every time I read it, I get mad. But the anomalous slip of the inferior tibiofibular ligament. It should not contribute to recurrent ankle sprain unless the ATFL is incompetent. Remember now, I said tibiofibular. That's a slip or a component of your distal syndesmosis anteriorly. The CFL, primary ligamentous restraint to inversion. Now, you test that with the ankle dorsiflexed. The spring ligament, they love the spring ligament, y'all. The origin, coronary cavity of the calcaneus, which means the, really means the distal edge of the sustentaculum tailing, inferior distal edge of the sustentaculum. It inserts on the plantar inferior surface of the tarsal navicular. It's the most commonly injured component in posterior tibial tendon insufficiency. Uh, I mean, the most co commonly part injured is the superior medial portion superior medial portion of the, of the spring ligament is what gives way in posterior tibial insufficiency and supports the Taylor head. Um, remember that the plantar aponeurosis sort of acts somewhere in between static and dynamic uh, support because it inserts into the proximal phalanges and the flexor tendon sheaths of all five toes. Uh, now, the plantar plate, I'll tell you, they, they like to hit that too. It has to be the second MTP joint. And I'll get, I'll get to that more because it deserves it. It must become lax before the abnormal dorsal translation of the proximal phalanx can occur. 
If you've got a positive Lachman at an MTP joint, excuse me, Dr. Miller, we use Lachman's too, the plantar plate has to be weak. Once attenuated, listen now, once attenuated, once the plantar plate's attenuated and the base of the proximal phalanx starts camming, I mean, starts non-camming, starts sliding up, translating up, then the most deforming force to keep it going to the hammer toe, claw toe deformity is the EDL. It's weakest at its origin from the metatarsal neck. They like that one too. Now, the injury to the lateral medial plantar nerves and intrinsic minus hallux or intrinsic minus toes in the forefoot. Injury to the deep perineal nerve, weak or absent EDB and EHB function, CMT and trauma. Another thing they'll ask you is check the posterior tibial muscle strength with the foot everted. Start off with it everted and plantar flexed to negate recruitment of the anterior tib with inversion. In other words, they can get it uh, over to the midline, but they can't get it to past the midline if their posterior tibial tendon is out unless they recruit the TA and they start dorsiflexion and inverting. You've all seen it in the office in patients, you, in the clinic. You, you know what I'm talking about. Inability to initiate heel rise from stent phase, injury, posterior tibial tendon, inversion of dorsiflex ankle. Just gave you that and that, but that's for emphasis. Now, why do I throw a slide like that in? Because you're going to hear distal soft tissue realignment in a variety of bunion operations. Distal soft tissue realignment. Well, I want you to know what, what, that, what they're talking about. Um, Bobby Erden said, don't tell them concepts, Dr. Richardson. Tell them content. But I've got to give you a little bit of concepts here. If these sesamoids are not in their facets, then you're going to get an... Who cares about the sesamoids? What you care about is the muscles that go into them. And the FHB and the adductor and the abductor halluses are not balanced you're going to get a recurrence of deformity. So, what they're talking about with distal soft tissue realignment is putting these sesamoids in their facets, therefore through the pulley system bringing the FHL back in place and realigning both the medial and lateral uh, restraints and governing musculotendinous units. So that, that's why I, I emphasize that. This is just a visual uh, that we dissected out and I want you to look at it. Um, one of the fellows a number of years ago did this dissection, um, Mike Simpson. But you see that little bitty bone here, that lateral sesamoid, and then you see the, the tibial sesamoid. Well, you can see that these muscles converge on a little small area. And you also got to remember that the adductor halysis doesn't just go to the base of the proximal phalanx. It is integrally involved and inserted on the lateral sesamoid and must be released. The FHL goes wherever these sesamoids take it. So anyway, that's enough for concepts. We'll get back just to content. I hate for you to have to sit down and memorize these angles, y'all, but you, you're going to have to do it. Um, they're, they're not that hard to remember, but you've got to remember that the uh, normal hallux valgus angle, less than 15, this metatarsus primus varus angle it just means a cuneiform, medial cuneiform base of the first metatarsal angle, less than 25 degrees. That's the least important angle to remember because if it looks like the first metatarsal is way over in varus, it is. And they're trying to tell you it's a hypermobile first ray, whatever that is. That's what they're trying to tell you on the exam. The first and second intermetatarsal angle, less than 10 degrees. Now, this one right here, you've got to know. The DMAA, the distal metatarsal articular angle, less than 15 degrees. A normal resting posture of the hallux on the head of the first metatarsal is about 10 to 15 degrees. That's the way we were put together. That's the way we're supposed to be. But if that, <clears throat> look up here, if that scoop of ice cream falls off the cone in a little bit of valgus more than it should, then that's normal for that patient. You can't bring the toe straight and leave that crooked. And that's going to be the, the theme of some of the uh, uh, reasoning uh, driven, reason driven operations that's ahead of us in a minute. Another visual, just for you to get an idea. Look over here. This is a little old 17 year old girl who had adolescent or juvenile hallux valgus. 
Of course, she had to be a, <clears throat> a urologist's daughter, and of course, her toe had to go crooked again. The distal metatarsal articular angle, this is the way you measure it. it it's in the literature. You, you can measure it, but it's uh, just to let you know, the, the longitude, the, this is a K wire right here, and this is right down the center. Believe it or not, there's another K wire over here hidden by this little uh, homing. But if this is excessive, uh, valgus posturing, you've got to plan it into your operation. And that's what they're trying to, to get you to learn and to do. They like words like mild, moderate, severe. So sort of implant that in your mind. And these angles roughly uh, implant those in your mind. Less than 20, 25 or less uh, HVA and an IMA of less than 12. A severe is 41 to 50 hallux valgus angle, intermetatarsal angle 16 to 20, and of course the moderates have got to be in between. They like to put this wording, severe uh, hallux valgus, a uh, 48-year-old or 55-year-old person with severe hypermobile first ray. What they're asking you is to do a lapidus. And what they're asking you in the one that's essentially in a wheelchair and she's 87 years old and has to be woken up to eat her dinner, that's the one they want you to do a Keller in. I ain't laughing at her. I'm not far from there. <laughs> the, the treatment options for the uh, hallux valgus, uh, you need to know some of the... I don't know why they keep throwing the Mitchell in there. I'm not going to tell you uh, that I think the Mitchell is not that bad an operation. I think it is. You don't want to know that. But nonetheless, nobody does them anymore unless you're from Henry Ford Hospital. So, but it's still a good operation. But d don't pick it. Never pick it on this exam. Um, now, a chevron osteotomy for mild, that's mild, isn't it? And it's congruent. I'm going to show you a picture of it in a minute. For incongruent joint, distal soft tissue realignment and a chevron. Um, uh, e either one of those are fine uh, or combined. Oh, the avascular necrosis of the capital fragment of a distal metatarsal osteotomy is not high like it was uh, when Dr. Miller and I came along. He probably never paid much attention to that, but w when, when I was coming along in this line of work, the um, avascular necrosis rate was very high, supposedly, after a distal metatarsal chevron osteotomy. But that, that's out now. It's not. So you can do a web space release. So we'll get to that in just a minute. And I think this is the, it seemed like I wrote down, yeah, page 315, tables, table 5-4. If you'll write that down, just go to your text chapter, table, uh, page 315, um, page 315, table 5-4. And that'll pretty much um, tell you what you need to know. Now, I don't believe you're going to be, I don't, I think this is a slider to throw y'all the, the shaft osteotomy. Have any of you heard of a long diaphyseal shaft osteotomy called a Ludloff or a scarf or a mound? Any of you ever heard of that? See, I bet you they don't even ask you. It's about time for them to start asking about diaphyseal osteotomies. It's just about that time. So I'm going to tell you, all you have to remember are two or three things. Technically difficult operation. Two, troughing. T-R-O-U-G-H-I-N-G. -G. All that means is when you make that big old cut up and down the bone and slide one fragment uh, laterally to correct the intermetatarsal angle, one of the cortex, the medial cortex of the dorsal fragment, falls into the trough, the intramedullary canal of the plantar fragment. It rotates the bone and you get a malunion and transfer metatarsalgia. Difficult operation, troughing, malunion with transfer metatarsalgia. I hope they don't ask you, but if, you, if, if somebody calls me and says, why didn't you talk about it, at least I'll say uh, I said something about it. I just, think, I just know all those folks, and I bet it's about time for them to start doing it. Now, if you've got a, an adolescent hallux valgus with, see that congress joint? You see that's, it might be a millimeter sublux, but essentially that's congress incongruity. They're asking you to do a biplanar distal chevron osteotomy. Biplanar, by that I mean translational and angular. You shove it over, you know, three to five millimeters laterally, 
but you also do a one to three millimeter closing wedge uh, uh, osteotomy immediately to correct the DMAA. Can you see that if I brought that hallux completely straight with my medial capsularity, wouldn't it be in Congress and Varus? Does that make sense to y'all? Yeah. Uh, now, in this patient, 62-year-old, HVA large, IMA large, severe, they're asking you for a proximal metatarsal osteotomy. They'll call it a crescentic or a chevron, or, but nonetheless, a proximal metatarsal osteotomy and that distal soft tissue realignment trying to get these sesamoids back in their facets where they belong. Why? To reduce the rate of recurrence. So these are some exceptions or uh, semi-outliers. Severe deformity in the, elder, in the elderly, a Keller resection, don't do the Mayo. You've got a, a, an elderly patient with marked hallux valgus. The skin is tenuous medially. They keep breaking down even in a house shoe. That's the only place I can see that they're bringing you toward a simple bunionectomy because it's, it's, you don't do it for any other reason. Hallux valgus and DJD. Uh, Arthrodesis, except in the elderly sedentary patient, again, Keller. Uh, Hallux valgus in a Down syndrome patient with ligamentous laxity, a cerebral palsy patient, or the generalized Ehlers-Danlos without an underlying uh, neurological problem. Arthrodesis, first MTP joint is what they want. Juvenile Hallux valgus, usually with excessive DMA, A, they want a biplanar osteotomy, the most common complication is recurrence of deformity. Now, do y'all see this big soft tissue uh, swelling out here? And can you barely see a lytic area through here? If you see a lot of soft tissue swelling and they give you some acute onset of pain in this hallux valgus that wasn't bothering them too much before, they're probably uh, pointing you toward gout and they're probably pointing you toward an arthrodesis. I just didn't have an arthrodesis to show you, uh, so she got a Keller. But that, they're po probably pointing you toward to breed this. You're not going to have much head left. You might need to bone graft it and fuse it. Most common cause of failure in hallux valgus surgery is insufficient uh, preoperative assessment. Um, now, if, if there's a broad general statement like, failure of hallux valgus surgery, that's the answer. If they're asking you why a specific procedure failed, a Keller, a proximal osteotomy, a chevron, a diaphyseal shaft osteotomy, then you've got to come up with something else. Um, and I'll tell you what to come up with in a second. Um, look at this carefully. Um, excessive DMAA, biplanar osteotomy. But if you don't close it down, I put this as sort of a visual so you could put it, this will stick in your mind better than my talking. The, it let, the DMAA was not corrected by the biplanar osteotomy and that's what, that's what got this patient in the subluxed uh, joint. 15 degrees is the magic number for the DMAA. They also want you to know is you can do all kind of osteotomies. See these three different osteotomies and it's still got the same deformity it started with? Why? Distal soft tissue realignment was not done. No matter what you do to the bones, you've got to make the muscles balance the bones at an unstable joint. Complications. They like to ask this. Complications of a chevron, most commonly, failure to correct deformity. Why? You tried to push the operation too far push it into the upper moderate to severe degree. It wasn't made for that. Uh, Mitchell, malunion with transfer of metatarsalgia. That's what they want. Basilar osteotomy, no matter what kind you do, they're also going for the malunion dorsal. Now, uh, go down here to the hallux bears because I don't want to confuse you in the chapter. In the largest series of proximal metatarsal osteotomies and distal soft tissue repair with the longest term follow-up, the most common complication is hallux varus. It's 11 to 13 percent. But we're talking about one or two degrees of hallux valgus in those studies. The symptomatic hallux varus was three to four degrees. So they're not going to throw you a slider on this. They don't, they don't want you to put hallux varus. They want you to put malunion, dorsal, 
malunion with transfer metatarsalgia. And frequently they'll show you a second metatarsal that gestalt-wise looks real long to you. It looks real longer than the first metatarsal. What they're pushing you toward is <coughs> the basal metatarsal osteotomy healed in a little bit of dorsiflexion, and that long second metatarsal is now taking all of the hit. It's got transfer metatarsalgia followed later by a hammer toe. Now, if you've got, this is a peculiar problem. I, I don't think they're going to throw this at you, but I think some of my foot and ankle buddies, they're, I don't know. I like them all. I don't trust them sometimes. The, uh, anyway, you notice this, how severe this is. It's very uncommon to get this much congruity at the MTP joint when you got this much varus of the first metatarsal. So this is a rare bird. This is a severe hallux valgus with a congruent joint. Now, if you do a basal metatarsal osteotomy and leave that, look at, look at the DMAA on that patient. If, you, if that's one part of the articular surface, just give me that, y'all. And that's the other part. Can you see that's pointing way over here? That's a built-in hallux varus. So what they're asking you here is a double osteotomy. They're asking you for a closing wedge osteotomy distally, maybe translational too, to get a few more degrees correction. And they're asking you for a proximal metatarsal osteotomy to correct this excessive DMAA, and they want you to get an x-ray in the operating room. In the operating room. Now, let's say this is a child, well, a 14-year-old girl, and, and they're... Uh, 12-year-old girl, and their physis is open, but severe deformity and recurrent pain, and you're, and you're operating on them. They'll mention, because the physis is open, a medial opening wedge cuneiform osteotomy with a bone graft, because they don't want you to close the physis down if they still have some growth in it. But the double osteotomy here, and either here in closed physis or here in open physis. Um, if not, you might get this. Now, they also like this, y'all. Look over here. Do you see how this medial eminence fit, looks scalloped out? It, it's, it looks like too much bone was taken out. But do you also see that the fibular sesamoid is still in place? What they'll ask you is the, uh, the most common cause of hallux varus with a basilar metatarsal osteotomy. If you, the most common cause is if somebody's resected the medial, I mean the lateral sesamoid. But if you see the lateral sesamoid in place, then, and, and by the way, that, that's what you'll see mostly on the x-ray that they give you. The reason is excessive medial eminence removal. That's the cause of the hallux. That's the button you push. If you don't see the fibular sesamoid by chance, then okay, push the fibular sesamoid resection button. Now, the recurrence of deform in the Keller resection, most common complication, recurrence of deformity. Most severe complication is the cock up toe. If they show you a photograph, a clinical photograph that looks like that and say, what went wrong with the Keller? The FHL is intimately pushed up against the base of the proximal phala phalanx plantarward by the pulley system. You've got to take the pulley system down to do a Keller. Well, what happened, if they show you an x-ray like this, you've got to tell them FHL was cut. That's, that's a complication of a Keller procedure. If they show you a complication like this, which is a multi-planar clawed hallux that I'll show you in just a second, what they're asking you there is loss of intrinsic muscle flexion at the MTP joint. That's what they're asking you there. You, you've taken off the base of the proximal phalanx, and the FHB has lost its insertion. <laughs> Don't do a fibula sesamoidectomy. That's not, that's not allowed, I'm afraid. Um, now, multiplanar hallux valgus, right over, uh, I mean hallux ferris is over here. Uniplanar over here, if they show you a picture like this, and they might, this is a uniplanar, it's primarily in that, in that uh, transverse uh, plane, that's almost always supple, it's almost always uh, treatable with just taping or even a hose. It'll bring it back to neutral. 
If you have to operate on that, if most of the time it is asymptomatic even when it's large, as opposed to this multiplanar that's almost always symptomatic. A uniplanar, how it's varus, supple, able to reduce it with just a sock. The operation you want to do, the, the button you want to push is an EHL transfer moving the tendon, now listen to me, deep to the transverse metatarsal ligament. You'll lose its, its tenodesis, well, they, they say it's dynamic. Let, let's say it's dynamic. You, you'll lose the effect of the EHL transfer. If they say uh, EHL transfer, they'll say and arthrodesis of the IP joint. But they might say half of the EHL. Then you don't have to arthrodesis. Then we'll give you both choices on that. It depends on who writes the question and where they train. But EHL transfer deep to the transverse metatarsal ligament. Does anybody want me to say that again? Are you okay with that? Say it again. Deep to the, you've got to put the transfer deep to the transverse metatarsal ligament. If it says in the question, take half the EHL, you don't have to fuse the IP joint. If they just say take the EHL, you've got to fuse the IP joint. So that will be another, uh, another choice, EHL transfer and IP joint. Uh, and that's the one you want to circle. You okay? Now, uh, if you're doing a lapidus, the most common complication is a malunion uh, radiographically, but clinically the transfer, you get transfer of metatarsalgia. And the way they phrase it, they, they won't do this to you, uh, both of these. Uh, they won't phrase it so you get, you get confused about what they want. They'll either say a radiographic malunion or they'll say transfer of metatarsalgia. Now, complications, uh, fail total uh, MTP joint replacement. They want you to do an interposition bone graft. A fail Keller, they want you to do an interposition uh, bone graft. Um, one thing I, did, I didn't tell you that I'm afraid it's going to be on the exam. You see that, you see that Band-Aid, most common symptomatic anatomical location after an intrinsic minus hallux or a varus hallux from, from a failed uh, bunion procedure or Keller, pain at the IP joint of the hallux. So what do you do for this? The operation you ought to choose is an arthrodesis of the first MTP joint for the multiplanar deformity with a capsulotomy at the IP joint. If they don't give you, if they don't give you the... Uh, the uh, arthrodesis choice, do the EHL transfer and the IP joint fusion. But they'll probably want you to do the arthrodesis and the IP joint capsulography, capsulotomy. Just a little comic relief. I know you're getting tired of bunions. Too much foot for too little shoes, so tell them you can't do much about that. Now, sesamoid injuries, they like that too. Um, the uh, all of these different conditions affect the uh, sesamoid. Don't don't memorize all of those, but um, the tibial sesamoid is most commonly injured due to weight bearing stresses on it being more than the other uh, sesamoid. Uh, they'll ask you for functions of the sesamoid. They'll list four of these and. Um, and then on the fifth one, it won't make sense. So if you can uh, learn these, or if several of them don't make, don't make any sense, but they give you this, this is their favorite. Provide the fulcrum for the short flexors to have power of MTP joint flexion. They want you to get a sesamoid view. Remember now, you start doing lateral releases at the MTP, I'm back to hallux valgus. You start doing lateral releases at the MTP joint when that tibial sesamoid is more than 50% across the crista. Now, what differentiates a bipartite sesamoid from a fracture? The bipartite sesamoid almost always will be in the tibial sesamoid. The fibula sesamoid is bipartite in only 1% to 3% of patients. The um, the fracture will have uneven surfaces, and it might be comminuted. 
Now, with the first MTP joint um, dislocation, and th they've had this on the exam too, it's a, you get a clawed or intrinsic minus hallux. Frequently, it's a high-performance athlete. Do you see, it's hard to see, I put some markers there. These sesamoids have retracted proximally, and they will almost always give you the other toe, and you'll wonder why the other toe is there. It's so you can look at where these sesamoids are lying compared to this one. So this was probably a dislocation dorsally of the first MTP joint with a spontaneous relocation followed by an intrinsic minus hallux. By the way, this can be devastating to a high-performance athlete that's making $50,000 a game. Now, uh, take that out of your mind at false negatives. I wrote that down wrong. False positives are frequent uh, with a bone scan, but it can help differentiate uh, just an irritated bipartite sesamoid versus a fracture. Uh, a fracture will have intense activity, and if they get a collimated one, real focused down bone scan, they can even tell you which sesamoid is involved. If, a, if you've got four-foot valgus, I don't know how many of you have heard that word before, but your normal resting posture is a little bit of four-foot supination. That's what we're comfortable with as orthopods. But four-foot varus or four-foot supination is normal resting. If they've got resting four-foot valgus like this, then you don't, uh, and the first metatarsal is not passively correctable uh, past the second metatarsal when you lift it dorsally, then you can't do a, a, a tibial a sesamoid shaving uh, in a plantar flex first ray. That's the point they're trying to make. Bipartite sesamoid, 10 to 15% of the population, usually a tibial, 25% bilateral. For some reason or other, they, they, like, they like things like this, and I don't know why. But see how smooth those edges are? That, gets, that shows you that it's, um, it's a bipartite. This is a uh, tibial shaving, again, on a weight-bearing lateral x-ray, if the uh, first metatarsal declination angle is greater than 20 or 25 degrees on the lateral, or you can't reduce the first metatarsal past the second with passive dorsiflexion, you can't do a tibial shaving. Now, if you're going to take the tibial sesamoid out, do it not through a midline medial approach, but through this plantar approach. But what's, what is so vulnerable is the proper branch of the medial plantar nerve. It's a long, exposed, sinewy branch of that medial plantar nerve, much like the ulnar digital nerve to the little finger that exits from beneath the, the palmar fascia so early. Well, this nerve exits from the plantar fascia very early, and it's very vulnerable, and it looks just like, the, now I'm teaching, just like the tissue around it. So when you make your skin incision, put your knife down. Now, if you're going to take your fibula sesamoid out, plantar approach, beware of the first common branch to the first web space, or particularly the proper branch to the lateral side of the hallux. It has to be pulled out of the place, out of the way to do a fibula sesamoidectomy. It's right over it. But still do a plantar approach. It's easier than a dorsal approach. At least that's what I think they'll ask you to do. To bring up to you one more time, look at that hallux and varus. We're pushing, I'm cheating, I'm, I'm pushing through an open medial wound here, pushing the fibula sesamoid out, uh, showing that if you take that out, you can get that. Now, <clears throat> bilateral sesamoiditis, they like this one too, in a young adult male. Think of writer's disease. Uh, that's not dysentery, I'm sorry, y'all. That's enthesopathy of inflammatory bowel disease, like regional enteritis or ulcerative colitis. Um, or, or some, you know, parasitic thing, pa psoriatic arthritis, seronegative rheumatoid disease, and a, and, and a host of other things that keep our rheumatology colleagues uh, paying their house note. Remember, prolonged conservative treatment with sesamoid injuries. That's the answer they probably want. If they, had, if they don't give you prolonged conservative treatment, extensive, and all those words stick with pads, dancer's pads, metatarsal pads, rocker soles, stick with something. If the sesamoidectomy is the right answer, then the fracture separation should be greater than three millimeters and persistent pain. Now, every once in a while they'll give you, in a high performance athlete, the option of bone grafting a, a, um, a fractured sesamoid. 
you can't bone graft it if there's more than three, three millimeters uh, of, uh, of separation or gross motion. Otherwise, you, I mean, if that's the case, you have to excise it. Now, I'm going to hit this pretty heavy, the synovitis of the second MTP joint, simply because they hit it heavy. Um, and we're going to go through some of these hammer toe, claw toe, crossover toe deformities. Um, the uh, hammer toes may be present with synovitis, swelling of the MTP joint, tender to palpation, dorsolateral aspect of the second MTP joint particularly tenderness at the plantar plate. Most vulnerable portion to rupture, proximal. But where they're tender is near the base of the proximal phalanx. They're tender along the, the uh, plantar plate. A positive Lachman. It doesn't have to be a big positive where you can just completely dislocate it. Just a little bit of subluxation compared to the other side. They might phrase it that way. And you have decreased flexion of the MTP joint due to the sign of a swelling of the joint and some transposition of your intrinsic flexion moment arms. Now, why did I show you this? The natural history of untreated second MTP joint synovitis is this, a dislocated second metatarsophalangeal joint. Um, I wanted you to see that. I wanted you to see that also because what they're getting at is they want you to do this to treat it. Part of the corrective procedure is not just um, correction of your hallux valgus if you've got a marked crossover toe deformity. And this one, it, it's, not, it's not a crossover toe, but we'll get to that in a moment. They want you to do this, a distal oblique shortening metatarsal osteotomy. You see the marked subluxation or dislocation here, and you see the osteotomy, the translation plantarward with reduction of the joint, I think they're going to use the word with reduction of the joint rather than stabilizing the joint because you don't repair the plantar plate. But if they say reduction or stabilizing, either way, for a dislocated second MTP joint, and they're asking you to choose a distal, uh, I mean, one of your choices are distal oblique metatarsal osteotomy. Choose it. Choose this wild osteotomy, the distal oblique shortening metatarsal osteotomy. They'll also then come back and say, this patient has had this osteotomy for the deformity I just told you, what is the most common complication? And you're to answer the inability to flex the metatarsophalangeal joint causing a, 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 a dorsiflexion of the second toe. They can't get the second toe to the ground. Why? Look at the little marker up here. If you, if you translate this head plantarward, the intrinsics, the second and third, I mean the first and second dorsal interossei do not go with it. They stay and they slide just dorsal because they're just plantar. They now slide normally. They slide just dorsal to the instant center of rotation of the first MTP joint. Now the interossei cannot flex the MTP joint. They just can't do it. So you get an extensor extension or dorsiflexion posture to the second MTP joint. That's the most common complication of the distal metatarsal osteotomy. Now, um, let's go to the uh, mallet toe, what, and then we'll go back to the other one. I want to uh, cover these, though. What they want you to do, look at this patient's third and fourth uh, toes. Not too much deformity back here. Mostly it's at the DIP joint. They're not asking you to do just a condylectomy of the middle phalanx. They want you to add an FDL tenotomy, either through the joint or a separate incision plantar in the midline. Remember this now. They want you to do an FDL tenotomy in addition to the condylectomy. Now, they might say, not say condylectomy, they might say arthrodesis of the DIP joint and tenotomy of the FDL. Okay, but they won't give you both. So you can either fuse that DFP joint or you can do a resection arthroplasty with a dermodesis, but you've got to add the FDL to it. They won't, they won't ask you to do both. Now, if you would, what I'd like you to do is to um, go on, on page, on, in your book, your Miller's textbook review, on page 322,
table 5-6. I'm not going to go through all this because it's not going to stick with you. Let me tell you what they're most likely to answer. Answer, But I, I would like you just to look at that sheet sometime between now and July the 8th, that algorithm. What they're trying to get you to do is they're going to say, what is your treatment of choice for flexible hammer toe? And your answer is going to be flexor to extensor transfer. They're then going to ask you maybe a question about a clawed toe. What is your treatment for a clawed second MTP joint, a clawed toe? And your answer is going to be a distal metatarsal oblique osteotomy and an FDL transfer. That's going to be your answer. There are all kind of ways to do it, but that, that should be your answer. Now, the, um, ne never resect the base of the proximal phalanx. That will never be an answer. And if there's a fixed flexor contracture at the PIP joint, don't arthrodise that joint. Do a head and neck resection of the proximal phalanx. Some of this might go contrary to what your teachers have taught you. For heaven's sake, do what they taught you. That's what works in their hands. We're, all we're talking about is pushing buttons so that July the 9th you wake up and say, freedom. Life begins on July the 9th. And I salute all of you who are about to live on that day. Now, the, um, by the way, on the second MTP joint subluxation dislocation, if they offer a molded arthroplasty of the second metatarsal head, in other words, a partial resection of the metatarsal head, layer millimeter by millimeter until the toe goes down, don't choose it. Five years ago, I would have had you choose a DeVries uh, partial resection or molded arthroplasty of the second metatarsal head to reduce a severe clawed second toe. Don't choose that anymore. Choose that osteotomy I talked about. Now, bunionette deformity. If you've got a metatarsus quintus valgus, that's just a big old word to say the fifth metatarsal is way apart from the fourth metatarsal, and they very well might give you this. They might give you a... Um, Eight degrees, the, the intermetatarsal angle four and five is greater than eight degrees. That's the magic number. Then you want to do a diaphyseal osteotomy, a long diaphyseal osteotomy, rotational. Now listen carefully to this. If they add to the question and there's a painful callosity plantarward beneath the fifth metatarsal head, you make that a biplanar diaphyseal osteotomy if it's got metatarsus quintus valgus. So you can correct the IM angle and dorsiflex it a little bit to take pressure off the bottom. That's for a type 3 bunionette deformity with increased metatarsus quintus valgus. If you've got a type 2, which is just sort of a, a big old metatar fifth metatarsal head, which by the way is a radiographic a trick that's played on us orthopods, but it looks like a big old fifth metatarsal head compared to the fourth, you do a lateral condylectomy, and you transfer the head immediately with a chevron. Type 2, bunionette, chevron. Type 3, long diaphyseal osteotomy. But if you've got a plantar callosity, when you move that chevron over, you either got to dorsiflex a little bit or shave off the plantar condyle. If you've got a type 1 deformity, which is just a big old lateral eminence, then you can just take that off. That's a type 1 deformity. Never excise the fifth metatarsal head. Plantar callosity, always shave the plantar aspect of the metatarsal head or dorsiflex it if your osteotomy allows. Now, let's move over to... Oh, whenever you hear the word claw toe, in your mind think metatarsal phalangeal joint. Whenever you hear the word hammer toe on this exam, think of PIP joint. It'll be interchanged easily in a lecture like this. But that's, that's how you think. Now, let's go to the neuromas. The third web space is involved in 80 to 90 percent of the time. The pathologist that spends 15 seconds looking at that slide and makes more than you do is called perineural fibrosis. The most common cause of failure of surgery is recurrence, which means a stump neuroma from inadequate proximal excision of that nerve. 
you need to get it about two centimeters proximal to the deep transverse intermetatarsal ligament. The structure on which the interdigital nerve is compressed is the transverse metatarsal ligament. For first come, it's a dorsal o. Always, always, always try conservative management. You always look in your question, have they tried that yet? Uh, dorsal for the first time, uh, resected way proximal to the metatarsal, uh, trans inter uh, transverse intermetatarsal ligament. A recurrence is really just a glioma at the end of a, of, of a nerve from inadequate resection through a little old pinhole incision. Um, if they show you, if they say a large bursa was wrapped around this nerve, they can lead you into this. I don't think they're going to do it, but if they mention bursa around an interdigital nerve, they might have you going toward the, uh, working that patient up for one of the inflammatory arthritides. One of the implants. So if, if they mention bursa, start looking in the question for, uh, they want me to get a rheumatoid factor, or uh, what's going on here? I better stand still. I'm feeling like a tele-evangelist. Um, my wife's a minister. She wouldn't appreciate me saying that, but she's not a tele-evangelist. Uh, that's okay, though, if, if, that's my, if that's your thing. The longitude... Uh, the synovitis, second... The reason I'm approaching this again is it can be confused with a second web space neuroma. But the area of tenderness, uh, for one thing, uh, to separate them out is you've got tenderness at the capsule, but remember, that's not a centimeter away from your web space. Uh, further attenuation of the plantar plate will give you some instability of the joint. So A is nerve and B is uh, joint and it has a positive Lachman. Now, if you've got a crossover toe deformity, a COT, cot deformity, if you've got that and a severe hallux valgus and that old second toe is hanging over the big toe, you've got to correct the hallux valgus. Now listen to me because this will throw you off. This is out of kelter with the normal wording they use. They'll use the, the bunion deformity as asymptomatic. You've still got to correct it. You've got no place to put the second toe. And by the way, when you get back home, you make sure your patient, you know, understands. I know it doesn't hurt, but you live with this, or we've got to correct the big toe too first. And you don't have a painful big toe. When I get through with you, it might be painful. And then see if they want to do it. But you, on that test, push the button that says, how it's valgus correction and second toe. Um, just remember... With an FDL transfer, the tendon is always below the deep transverse intermetatarsal ligament. Let's leave it where it is. Um, now, the treatment non-operatively is a steel shank rocker sole or a metatarsal pad. Now, they might walk you down this way. A cortisone injection might give what? Well, it can result. You already got a, 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 a compromised capsuloligamentous apparatus around the second MTP joint, including the plantar plate. So you put a cortisone shot in, you reduce the inflammation, you might develop a hammer toe uh, from your cortisone shot. Sometimes they'll ask you that. Now, every once in a while they'll throw you a, uh, a funky looking x-ray uh, like that. I, don't, I think that'll just gestalt Freiburg's teenage girl. In an adult, they'll throw you an enlarged metatarsal head reduced MTP joint motion, uh, become painful. Uh, she noticed it when she was 18 and now she's 36. That's Freiburg's. They might not even give you an x-ray on that, just the history. Asymptomatic since a teenager or minimally symptomatic. Now I got a big knot on my, on my foot doctor at the second metatarsal head. That's Freiburg's. Now, tarsal tunnel syndrome, anterior tarsal tunnel syndrome, wrong, upper motor neuron, um, Let's go over some of this, y'all, because it, 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 they hit it pretty hard. Poor correlation between EMG nerve conduction uh, and the clinical outcome. The earliest, put this in your mind, the earliest nerve conduction velocity abnormality is a sensory latency, increased sensory, sensory latency, not motor, in the lateral plantar nerve. Various, the, 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 the earliest uh, abnormality in an electrical study. Um, 
Don't get your electromyographer into all this discussion. Don't even go ask them. They'll tell you 20 reasons why that's not right. You just want to push that button right there. Uh, best results after release of the transverse retinacular ligament, space occupying lesions, old osteophytes from, uh, periarticular, from trauma and periarticular trauma, um, uh, neurilimomas, ganglions, big old venous clusters, etc. So. They also like to ask you uh, all these studies and then say, but is this really a clinical diagnosis? And your answer is yes. That's how you diagnose it with repeated examinations over an extended period and getting to know the patient real well. And if your studies corroborate what you feel is the right thing to do, fine. If they don't, you're on safe clinical grounds to that patient, which is most important, but you're also safe uh, medical legally to operate on that patient. <clears throat> now, they like to ask that you better take down the abductor halysis. Remember, the innervation has been the proximal third, so you can do this. Take it down in order to get the distal release. They love to ask that question. Um, this was a neurilimoma of the lateral, uh, of the lateral plantar nerve. Now, remember, anterior tarsal tunnel syndrome is deep perineal nerve. Deep perineal nerve, not superficial perineal nerve. Impingement beneath the distal margin of the inferior extensor retinaculum. There's a medial inferior limb of the inferior stem of the inferior extensor retinacula. How did I get into all that? It, it's the distal edge of it. Now, dorsal osteophytes over the apex of the medial longitudinal arch. Now, if they've got a young athlete, and he's not having superficial perineal nerve symptoms from, from ankle sprains, he's having numbness in his first web space when he runs. Well, first thing you do, I'm teaching, tell him to loosen his shoe up some. But they're asking you for entrapment up around the ankle, superior extensor retinaculum, not inferior. It's the people my age with bumps on the top of their foot that they're asking you for inferior extensor retinaculum. Those with degenerative arthritic change, y'all have all seen them in the office, the big knot up there, and you get an x-ray and you can't see it on the lateral view, and you know it's there because you just uh, examined it. Those are points of entrapment right there. Now, this is what they're going to ask you about the stroke patient <clears throat> uh, the stroke patient or the, the young, you know, the heaven forbid, 32-year-old mama of three with a, uh, a hemiparesis from a stroke. They're going to ask you, what do I do? Uh, what you should do for that patient. Well, number one, you wait a year before you do anything. You brace them, splint them, um, and you be a doctor to them as much as you can. And then equino varus deformity of the ankle and foot in a patient with a CVA, split anterior tibial tendon transfer, and a gastrocnemius recession. Now think with me just a minute. I'm going to go off of this upper motor neuron, and we've got a 33-year-old motorcycle, I mean a 23-year-old motorcycle rider. He falls off. He gets a stretch injury of his perineal nerve at the fibula neck. He's got a drop foot. It sort of wakes him up. He turns, goes back to school, and in a, in a hallucinatory moment, even goes to medical school. He becomes an anesthesiologist. He's tired of his brace. He's got a supple ankle and forefoot, hind foot, mid foot. What they're asking you to do is a posterior tibial tendon transfer through the interosseous membrane. That's what they're asking you to do, but not in an upper motor neuron injury. They're asking you to do a splat. Uh, they're also asking you to add a, a TAL if there's gastroc, if, if there's an aquinas deformity of greater than 10 degrees, and they want tenotomies, tendon lengthenings, and fascial releases. They don't want arthrodesis unless, it's, unless there's just no other way to go. <coughs> now, uh, CMT, remember this, weak tibialis anterior, strong uh, perineus longus, results in a plantar flexed first ray. What is the opposite of that? What if you had a strong TA and a weak PL? Would you get a dorsal bunion? So put that up in your mind too. We're not talking about dorsal bunions that come from, from polio or something. We're talking about uh, uh, CMT here, hereditary motor sensory neuropathy, and infar as far as our orthopods, um, day in and day out activities in our clinic that literally, that essentially means CMT. 
All right, the plantar flex first ray. When that plantar flex first ray occurs, it then drives the hind foot into varus. So this is forefoot equinus from muscle imbalance between the TA and PL. Why the PL is spared in many patients with CMT, particularly type 1? I don't know if anybody knows that. But it's been proven electromyographically with muscle biopsies and clinically. So let's just take it for that. The PL is strong. The forefoot goes into uh, uh, plantar flex first ray, forefoot valgus. The only way the hind foot can get into weight bearing position is to go into varus. So the hind foot is driven by forefoot equinus. That's what they want to ask you, uh, that want you to know. The weak uh, perineus brevis and a strong posterior tib, which is its antagonist, the antagonist to the PB is the posterior tib. You get an adducted forefoot and then a plantar fascia contraction. You get the whole uh, shooting match. Remember, recurrent ankle sprains in a teenager playing sports. Test that perineus, uh, the perineals. They'll come in not even knowing they've got anything. Just my ankle keeps giving away on me. You've got to test them for, digression a moment, tarsal coalition and weak perineals. You've got to do it. <clears throat> um, if, you've got a, if they show you a foot like that, that's called global cavus. Um, the calcaneal pitch angle, I'll show you in a minute, is excessive. Four-foot Aquinas. Most patients with CMT will have four-foot Aquinas, but no hind-foot calcaneus. This is hind-foot calcaneus. And that's in polio. Now, out of the last five years of OITEs, three of them have had the Coleman block test on it. Whether it will be on your exam or not, I don't know, but it's for it. Determine the fixed versus flexibility of the hind foot. If there is a flexible... Any of y'all from Utah? Nobody from Utah. Well, Sherman Coleman did a lot for all of us, y'all. Hind foot... Hind foot supple. Can you see where the first metatarsal hangs off the medial border of that board? When, it, when that falls down, the hind foot goes into a neutral position, then you know it's not a fixed deformity. And that's what they're getting you to know. Fixed versus supple deformity. Because it changes your, your treatment algorithm. Do not forget the sensory component of hereditary motor sensory ne uh, neuropathy. Um, you may have ulceration. And by the way, they might ask you something like this. Um, Non-union and, and an ankle fusion in a CMT patient <clears throat> times two. Where they're, getting, where, where they're going with that is a Charcot arthropathy, like a diabetic. That's where, that's where they're going with that. And that's, what, that's the button you hit. Calcaneal pitch angle, you probably ought to put that somewhere in your mind. Greater than 30 degrees is abnormal, um, at least until July the 9th. The autosomal dominant form of CMT, duplication of chromosome 17. Maybe our pediatric uh, faculty member will give you this. I don't know. I, I didn't know what to do here. But duplication of chromosome 17. Now, the uh, peripheral myelin protein 22, write that down, PMP. Peripheral myelin protein 22 in the type 1 um, autosomal dominant CMT. That's the abnormality. They get the myelin sheath is markedly abnormal. The, it, the nerve thickens. And the, write this down. Nerve conduction velocity is, negative, it is uh, abnormal. Nerve conduction velocity abnormal in type 1. But in the neuronal type 2, it very well might be normal or minimally abnormal. I don't think they're going to ask you that, but they might. Now, what I want you to do is the next three slides um, on hereditary motor sensory neuropathy, I want you to forget. They're just not going to ask you sex links, and they're not going to ask you Desjardins Soda's disease. So just forget it. Just, just remember this slide. And one more uh, visual to show you why the uh, hind foot is correct, uh, is thrown into varus with a plantar flex first ray. You can see how that happens like that. Um, now look down in the post polio. See that calcaneal pitch angle is real high? 
and idiopathic it might be high, but in the CMT patient, the calcaneal pitch might be normal. That means forefoot Aquinas as opposed to global Aquinas is characteristic of CMT uh, entity. Now, um, usually in poliomyelitis, the extreme calcaneal uh, posturing of the uh, calcaneus is from a weak gastroxoleus. Um, before I forget it, in post-polio syndrome, that sometimes they'll show up in, a, in the foot and ankle practice and in yours too, just treat them conservatively. It's just they don't have any reserves left. Um, and that's what they might ask you. Um, bracing if the patient can stand it again. Uh, inserts. Gentle, they'll put the word gentle PT in there. But don't operate on them unless they're so unstable and, and, and just unbraceable. That's the only indication for surgery is instability and malalignment that's uh, fixed. Um, always think in the summary of this pest, cavus deformity, flexible versus fixed, and arthrodesis is a last resort. That's where they want you to go with that. Well, I got ahead of myself there. Now, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, they uh, always seem, well, they seem to have that down there pretty frequently, Some, something going on with rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid factor positive in 80% of the patients. Um, most common presentation in rheumatoid forefoot is uh, metatarsalgia. Most, the painful callosities are due to hyperextension deformities of the MTP joint. Now, recurrence of callosities is the most common complication after forefoot surgery because of insufficient resection of the metatarsal heads and necks. Recurrence of callosities, most common complication after forefoot surgery. You take those out, you get bursi back either beneath one or two because they're not resected back far enough. Excessive heel valgus, they might be asymptomatic. If the question reads, forefoot symptomatic, hind foot and marked valgus, but asymptomatic, they don't want you to operate on it. Also, hind foot valgus in the rheumatoid is not due to rheumatoid are, are due to posterior tibial insufficiency most of the time. It's due to insufficiency of the talocalcaneal interosseous ligament. And that's what they're looking for. It's a, it's, it's, it's a synovial line ligament. It's an enthesopathy. It gives way. And then just weight-bearing forces the heel into valgus. They're looking for talocalcaneal interosseous ligament insufficiency with hind foot valgus. I only operate on the forefoot if the hind foot is not uh, symptomatic. Uh, the treatment on the forefoot is arthrodesis of the first MTP joint and resection of the metatarsal heads, uh, two, three, four, and five. Most common cause of failure over triple arthrodesis is failure to correct excessive hind foot valgus malalignment. On the right, we've got inadequate bone resection. On the left, adequate bone resection. Um, now, I'm not going to go through the crystal-induced arthritis. I just think the basic science people will pick up on that. It's, we certainly see them fairly often in the foot and ankle uh, practice. Um, the seronegative spondyl arthropathy, they might show you a sausage toe. It's that reddish, purplish, third or fourth toe in a, uh, a lady, well, it could be man, the 30s, 40s, uh, never symptomatic before, spontaneous onset, of, of a swollen, purplish red third or fourth toe called dactylitis. You've got to think of psoriatic arthropathy, um, and that's the peak age. They'll ask for, uh, the patient has nail pitting, uh, but no skin lesions. It might precede skin lesions uh, in 20% of the patients. Um, Ryder syndrome um, is a, a basically an enthesopathy to y'all. Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, uh, rarely indicated for arthritis, and, the, and uh, they want to know that the uh, HLA B27 is highly positive, highly positive. 95% uh, and 90% in ankylo ankylosing spondylitic patients. Four out of five will be males. Now, they might hit this. I think this may be the only medical thing that foot and ankle surgeons get to play with. So they, um, they, they hit this pretty hard. It's a spirochete. It's got a red 
even five centimeters. Great big lesion, um, uh, red circle uh, with a white center. They'll give you a history of vacationing, uh, deer hunting, a tick bite. Might mention Connecticut, where it was described. The treatment is uh, doxycycline or amoxicillin. If they're not allergic to penicillin, you can give them amoxicillin and, and uh, doxycycline. The, the ID guys at our place are starting to give cephalosporin, but don't, don't, don't circle that. Um, it takes five to six months for serologies to turn positive after the inoculation. It is a vector-borne, you know, fleas or something, vector-borne uh, disease. Uh, Halix rigidus in adolescence, it's from an osteochondral injury. In adults, it's from osteoarthritis. Um, natural history, progressive loss of motion until they usually become asymptomatic. Remember this classification, its only use is treatment. They'll say a type 1, no joint space narrowing, minimal loss of motion, you use a bar. Type 2, still got some joint space left, prominent osteophytes, now, you want to do a chylectomy if they say something like this. Pain is mainly with dorsiflexion of the hallux, and there is a dorsal osteophyte. That's when a chylectomy is primarily used. But if they show you an oblique, an oblique x-ray and there's still some joint space all the way from top to bottom, they probably want you to do a chylectomy, even though the AP shows some periarticular osteophytes and the lateral shows a dorsal osteophyte. They probably want you to do a chylectomy if you've got any joint space left. Now, if they give you a runner with a dorsal osteophyte abutment, and they've got only about 30 or 40 degrees of MTP joint extension, and they emphasize that runner, young runner, uh, uh, competitive runner, they're pushing you toward a Moberg. Take off the dorsum of the first metatarsal head, and a dorsal closing wedge, proximal phalangeal basilar osteotomy. That's been on the exam, and they'll lead you to that with runner and young because they need 60 degrees of dorsiflexion, well, 50 or 60, to uh, compete uh, competitively, uh, to, to run competitively. Um, now, um, Pes planus is almost always on this exam going to end up either in a pediatric session uh, section in the, with the PD pods with flexible pes planus in the child, or it's going to end up with a posterior tibial tendon insufficiency in the adult. That's where they're going with this. Um, they want you to differentiate flexible and rigid simply because they want you to do this. It changes your treatment algorithm. Rigid, arthrodeses. Flexible, osteotomies, tendon transfers. Tenotomies if the uh, TAL, if the tendo Achilles is tight. You've got to be careful to check for undiagnosed tarsal coalition. Acquired pes planus, um, almost always, and for our purposes, posterior tib insufficiency, and it progresses gradually from flexible to rigid. They love to use these words. If it includes mildly, intermittently, occasionally symptomatic, always choose non-operative uh, function. Multiple insertions. They want to ask you all the insertions except the base of the proximal phalanx. That's the only one it's not on as far as the tarsus metatarsus is concerned. The posterior tibial tendon muscle unit, muscle tendon unit, is a dynamic stabilizer. It is behind the ligaments and it's behind the windless mechanism. Now, they might ask you this. What happens in this deformity when the heel goes out into valgus and posterior tib insufficiency? What they're asking you is to think in a triplane way. They're, tri to, they're making you think dorsiflexion in the sagittal plane, the calcaneus. Now, this is all relative to the talus. Dorsiflexion of the calcaneus, eversion um, in a uh, frontal plane, and abduction of the calcaneus in a transverse plane. That's what they're asking you to do. This is normal, and this is the, the posterior tib insufficient foot. Now, in your book, I have 20% incidence of, of, of patients remembering a traumatic event. Um, it's somewhere between 25 and 35. In other words, one out of five, one out of four patients will remember a traumatic event. That's what you should uh, uh, circle. They like this one. The reason most tendons give way where they do, most posterior tip tendons is 
This is the at-risk zone between the, uh, because the vinculi are up here, between the medial malleolus and, down here, and the uh, uh, tuberosity of the navicular. That's the at-risk zone for rupture. Now, it's about time for them to give you one of these. I hope they don't, but it might happen. And this is a fastball. This is not a curve. This is a legitimate thing. But it hasn't been on the exam before, but I just, I just think it's about to hit. The marked 90 degrees flexion of the talus, but yet this patient, believe it or not, can have a completely supple hind foot, mid foot, forefoot. Rare, but can happen. What they're asking you for is a double osteotomy. They're asking you for a, an Evans and a calcaneal slide osteotomy <coughs> with marked deformity. <coughs> They'll use that word and... and um, completely supple joints. They're also asking you for an FDL transfer immediately. Now, spring ligament, uh, we talked about its origin insertion. The superior medial portion is the part that gives way the most uh, frequent, uh, part that gives way with um, posterior tib insufficiency. Always check for a tarsal coalition. They like that many, too many toes sign. Remember we talked earlier about you can't get uh, from an everted position, you can't get to an inverted position uh, without recruiting the anterior tib if the posterior tib is out. Always, uh, they'll ask you about uh, heel rise and the heel stays in valgus, another good sign, particularly unilateral heel rise, that the posterior tib is insufficient. Uh, is they stage it in order to treatment recommendations. In other words, if there's a um, uh, tenosynovitis, uh, you treat it, of course, non-operatively, all of these, until they don't give you any other option. And this is just with inserts. Um, this is all, just treat this with inserts here. What they want in the stage two in a flexible deformity, this is what they want. They want a calcaneal sliding osteotomy and an FDL transfer. If they lead you down the path that there's an Aquinas contracture, they want you to add a TAL. And in your practice, go on and do it. Stage three. Fixed deformity, they want you to do an arthrodesis. Stage four, I'll show that in just a moment. They might want to know about the Taylor uh, declination angle. The larger this angle becomes, it's an angle between the longitudinal axis of the talus and the plantar surface of the weight-bearing foot. The larger this angle, the more severe the deformity. They'll talk about the talonavicular coverage angle, but they'll never give the specific values for it. They'll just say it's increased. I didn't want you to get confused by that. Yes, MRI might be helpful, but what they're trying to lead you into is this is a clinical diagnosis. If your MRI shows a normal posterior tibial tendon, but you know that patient has a plano valgus deformity, they've got swelling and tenderness around the posterior tib tendon, you've treated it for months and one way or another, and they're still symptomatic, you can have some false negatives and false positives on this study. Differential diagnosis are these, and they want you to treat it. Let's say you've got a 70-year-old. You put her in a cast for six weeks, much less symptomatic, but still some symptomatic. She does not want any surgery. You start off with a molded orthosis. Probably nothing's going to help that lady that doesn't go above the ankle. But for your test-taking purposes, you start off with a molded orthosis unless she has a fixed component to her deformity. She's still symptomatic after casting. She does not want surgery, and they'll lead you to a brace with fixed deformity. Flexible deformity, still symptomatic, don't want surgery. Don't go to this or even an AFO. Go to this. That's what they want, a molded uh, shoe insert. Uh, surgical management, a tenosynovectomy for stage one, for stage uh, two disease, even severe disease, I mean, you know, ruptured tendon or uh, postenotic extreme uh, um, injury to the tendon, chronic t uh, healing of the posterior tib with scarring continuity. Um, that's the F FDL, FHL over there. It's a long way over there, by the way. Stage two, even with marked deformity, if it's completely supple, they want a calcaneal osteotomy. But in the adolescent, in the adolescent of flexible pass planus, that you've done everything you can to and they want surgery, they want a lateral column lengthening. If they ask you if it's a lateral column lengthening, and they, if they say it in an adult, it's done through the CC joint, calcaneal keyboard joint, the most common complication is a non-union. 
But if they phrase the question, lateral column lengthening, what is the most common complication? This is with an Evans, you know, a distal uh, calcaneal osteotomy or uh, a CC joint. The most common complication is lateral column overload with callosities beneath the fifth metatarsal head or fifth metatarsal base. Most common complication in an arthrodesis, I mean in a, a CC, fu uh, a distraction uh, fusion at the CC joint, most common complication is nonunion. Most common complication, if this say lateral column lengthening and don't give you the type of procedure, lateral column overload. Marked deformity, fixed triple arthrodesis. Um, forget these next, these talon avicular and the uh, subtalar and the double. They just, they're not going to ask you all that. I, I don't believe that. If they're in the literature, but I think they, they might substitute a double for a triple, but you'll get the hint and certain. They won't give you both. They won't ask you both. Now, for a stage four means the, uh, the talus is tilted into valgus at the ankle joint, and the lateral side of the ankle joint has gone to pot. And they're asking you for a tibiotalocalconeal arthrodesis through one way or another. Now, six or eight weeks postoperatively, the patient has acute onset of pain where they've been essentially pain-free. It's at the distal tibia. It's a little red. It's tender, a little bit of swelling. They're asking you to get a bone scan for a stress fracture at the upper end of the nail or at a screw, uh, a screw head. They're asking you to get a bone scan if that's a scenario three months later when they've had a, a period of asymptomatic uh, time. Uh, this is the summary uh, for posterior tib insufficiency, and I wanted to um, uh, tell you which... Um, uh, well, I thought I wrote it down, which table. It's in, your, it's in, the, it's in the textbook. Uh, the table and the page. I thought I wrote it down, but I didn't. Now, in a kidney procedure, uh, all they want to know is this. You don't have to advance the uh, posterior tibial tendon. You can just sew it, take off the, the bone, the prominence, and sew the capsule back, bring the posterior tibial tendon right back up to its normal position. You don't have to advance it. I don't know why they like that so much, but they do. Perineal tendon pathology. Um, Perineus uh, brevis tears, um, split tears, longitudinal split tears of the perineus brevis most commonly occur at the fibular groove, at the fibular groove. And the initiating event is probably insufficiency of the SPR. Superior perineal retinaculum allows it to climb up over that sharp edge of the fibula. Perineus longus tears almost uh, always are in, at the calcaneal cuboid groove. To have an isolated PL tear with a normal looking PB at the superior perineal retinaculum is very rare, and I don't think they'll hit you with that. So think PB, SPR is where they're going to be injured. PL, cuboid groove. Have I gone through that too fast? Does that, that sort of make sense? Are you okay with that? Now, um, that, 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 see that third bullet, complete rupture? I, I got that all mixed up in my, um, in my writing all that out. So forget that one. But anyway, if 50% if of the perineus brevis tear, or le less than 50% uh, tear, you, you, you tube a longitudinal split of the perineus brevis. That's your treatment. If it has 50% tear, or if it's frayed even more than that, you just take it down and put the proximal end into the perineus longus. Now, this fibular groove they talk about so often probably comes out of a, a, a study that hasn't been beaten since, and that's in 1928 from Edwards, and that is uh, 82 uh, in OKU3. Now, this is OKU foot and ankle, not, not OKU uh, you know, five, uh, six editions ago. 18 to 28 percent will be flat or convex, in the original study, it was about 18%. So uh, you might want to keep that somewhere in your mind. This is uh, a classification, an algorithm that I uh, also, there's a, there's a chart, a table for that to go over. But perineal tendonitis without subluxation should be treated with just a, uh, uh, 
non-operative walking cast. Uh, type 2 perineal injury is similar to type 1, but involves uh, some subluxation of perineal tendons, usually younger than type 1, very athletic. Um, incomplete substance tear, fraying of the tendon, repair the SBR, deep the fibular groove, and repair longitudinal tears. Type 3, both tendons might be gone. Um, you might have the PL rupture and the PB intact. You rupture uh, usually at the keyboard groove with a PL, um, and it, it, if you uh, the, the osperineum is ossified in about 15% of the cases, and you might see it retracted up around the calcaneus. I'll show that in a minute. If they tell you that the patient has fixed hind foot varus and both tendons are ruptured, you need to do a calcaneal osteotomy, closing wedge, uh, a lateral ankle ligament repair, and, um, and, and try to find one tendon distal and one proximal to get a motor and sew it together. See that bone retracted up here? If they show you that x-ray, that's a PL tear because they picked out one that had an ossified perine osperineum and it's retracted proximally. You see a little bit of cavoid looking to that foot. That's how most of them will look with a PL rupture. Most common complication neurovascular wise, serial nerve damage. Uh, if they throw at you a prominent calcaneal tubercle, that's here. That might fray both tendons. That's rare. But if it's the perineal, if it's the calcaneal perineal tubercle, remember it's not the SPR, it's not the cuboid groove where they, the, cube, the PL goes to the base of the first. It's this big prominent bone. All of you have seen them. Sometimes you're so big you can see them literally visibly. Just they take the shoe off and you see it. That can fray both tendons. You've got to remove the perineal tubercle and repair or transfer the tendon as needed. Now, anterior tibial tendon injuries. If it's a young to middle-aged person, look for an inflammatory arthritis. However, if, a, if an elderly patient comes to your office and says, I've got a tired foot, I've got sort of a floppy foot, I had a lot of pain down in my foot for several weeks playing golf and tennis, but now the, uh, I don't have any pain, but I've got this tender knot, and it'll be up under the uh, just distal to the superior extensor retinaculum. That's a ruptured anterior tibial tendon. Every once in a while, you'll have a soccer player with a ruptured anterior tibial tendon and maybe even a bony avulsion. Well, young people, of course, they'll lead you down the path to go on and repair those. But in the elderly person, what they're looking for is uh, a brace, um, a, prolong a cast, and then a brace, and non-operative treatment because it's an, it's, it's an attritional rupture, and it's insertion into the medial caniform and base of the first metatarsal, and it's the devil to sew, and it's the devil to get length, the length of the tendon out. There's some controversy on that, but the button you push is non-operative. Don't inject them. Posterior ankle pain. Now, that can be a, a problem. Let's go to the ballet dancer. Uh, posterior ankle pain in the ballet uh, person, the dancer, the, 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 the serious dancer, uh, you might have some tenderness posterior laterally at the lateral process of the posterior tubercle. Remember, they like to ask this. The ostrigonum or the posterior tubercle of the talus is lateral to the FHL. Now, I mean, all of you know that, but just don't get tripped up on that. It's lateral to the FHL. Um, they get posterior, they'll tell you in the question, they get pain on point. That's FHL impingement. It could be ostrigonum syndrome, but they'll give you an x-ray. Sometimes they'll give you an MRI, and they'll give you a T1-weighted image, and the talus will be white. The ostrigonum, a big old outline of some bone back there, and you say, well, that looks like it ought to be the ostrigonum. It'll be black. And they're leading you down the path of ostrigonum injury in the ballerina. No bunion surgery for them. And if they have that burst fracture of their fifth metatarsal, long diaphyseal with a butterfly fragment, and you think, oh, my gosh, their career is ended, you do what, what Dr. Hamilton in New York tells them to do, soak it in their helmet. But anyway, that's a World War II. That, well, you don't operate on it. That's the bottom line. You don't operate on dancers with diaphyseal fractures, no matter how bad they look, in the fifth metatarsal. Don't, and they want you to know that so you don't get into trouble. They, they don't, that's not even a slider or a curveball. They, they just don't want you to get in trouble operating on them. Most common cause of recurrent ankle sprains, weak perineal uh, muscles. Um, to repair the FHL, 
And if they get a Coke bottle laceration and it's out at the IP joint, they come in eight weeks later to your office. That's what they'll give in there. You don't repair the FHL in the critical area of pulleys. You repair the FHL if they step on something and they're cut back proximal to the pulleys. Even that's a hard dissection. But the answer to that is repair it if it's proximal to the MTP joint, the laceration. Don't repair it if it's not. Um, if you've got a nodular tino, um, a tendon FHL with a nodular uh, nodule in it, you'll have some triggering at the IP joint. They might give you that. If it triggers at the IP joint, think, think posterior tubercle, posterior process, ostrigonal, impingement back there where the posterior talofibular ligament hits the lateral process of the talus and then has that pulley that goes on across. Chronic insertional Achilles tendonitis, what they're really getting at here is if over 50% of the tendon is involved, uh, by the way, let me stop just a second. If you've got, uh, it, uh, sometimes they'll come up with this. The origin of all this starts at the anterior aspect of this tendon. Uh, destroyed the retrocalconeal bursa from chronic inflammatory and collagenous repair, but most of the tendon, the, the bad tendon, is anterior. Uh, they want you to get a lateral x-ray before you leave the operating room to see how much bone you've cut off. They might lead you down that path. Say, I want a lateral x-ray. <clears throat> now, this is something different. Uh oh, if you've got more than 50% of the tendon involved, what they want you to do is to take it down and do an FHL transfer. And if that sounds a little bizarre to you because you're just not running in these foot and ankle circles, that's what they want you to do, and that's what they want you to do on the exam. And I don't know of anybody, I don't even know who writes the questions now, but I can't imagine anybody writing those questions in the foot and ankle circles. It, it, the answer is not more than 50% of involved, big hunk of bone in the tendon, you take it down and do an FHL transfer. Right or wrong, that's the button you push. Um, if the whole tendon is involved, you take all that down and do a transfer. See that big glob of calcification there? You do it. That'll be pretty straightforward. I don't think they're going to ask you that. Now, do you see between these two black lines this sort of bulge with a reduced signal in the anterior portion of the tendon? This is the garden snake that swallows the mouse trick. Uh, good tendon, good tendon, bulging tendon. If more than 50% of that tendon is involved, you also got to take it down and do a tendon transfer. If up to 50% is involved, you core it out and suture back what you core it out. Seems rather radical, but that's what I would circle on the exam. The bone spur is a result of the condition, recurrent chronic insertional Achilles tendonitis, inflammation, scar, collagen meta, uh, cartilage metaplasia followed by osseous metaplasia. You got a bone spur that didn't cause the problem. It's a result of the problem, but you've got to take it out if you're there. Uh, they probably want you to do a midline incision if it, and, and take down oh, up to 50% of the tendon. You don't have to do a transfer. And um, they want you to do through a midline posterior approach. That's probably how they'll, that's probably how they'll uh, word that. I wouldn't worry about haglands. It's just too confusing. These lines are too poorly reproducible from center to center radiographically. Um, but I want you to know on this MRI just what a haglands is. And they're going to show you Achilles tendon. Uh, well, I don't think they're going to show you. But if they do, Achilles tendon uh, attenuation, do a, do a prominent uh, posterior tubercle of the calcaneus. You debreed some tendon, you take this off, and you get a lateral x-ray. That's what they want to get at, get a lateral x-ray in the operating room. Uh, plantar fasciitis, I'm probably going to lose you all if I start talking about that. You just, you just, just stand so much of this stuff. Um, don't do an endoscopic plantar fascia release. That, they don't, they're not looking for that. I'm not saying there might not be a place for that. I'm not up here to say that. I'm just saying don't do it on your exam. Now, you've got the young, your runner, and they've got tenderness not at the origin of the plantar uh, fascia, plantarward immediately, but their tenderness is up on the medial edge of the calcaneal tuberosity. There, they've got entrapment of the lateral branch, the, the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve, Baxter's nerve, and they're getting some neuritic symptoms down into the 
uh, plantar surface of foot, which, by the way, might be neuritic symptoms in the hallux and second toe, medial plantar nerve sensation. But nonetheless, they're looking for the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve, which innervates what? The abductor digiti quinti. Um, high performance athlete um, releases, okay, requires incision, that's what they want, incision of the deep fascial envelope of the abductor hallucis. What it really is is the tendon of origin of the abductor hallucis. Prolonged conservative management, all of those things. If they offer you uh, several choices as far as stretching, choose tight Achilles. Just go on and choose that. Uh, one steroid injection, try to protect it, tell them they might rupture their plantar fascia. If they rupture their plantar fascia and then they get pain over the cuboid and lateral cuneiform, they're leading you down the path of uh, loss of medial column support, overload of the lateral uh, uh, compartment, uh, lateral column, and you've got a stress fracture or a stress reaction of bone in the base of the fourth uh, cuboid, base of the third lateral cuneiform, and they want you to get, they might show you a bone skin that's, that's hot over there. You've got to think to yourself, the plantar fascia, steroid injection, rupture, Maybe that's what's giving the dorsolateral foot pain in this patient that had recalcitrant plantar fasciitis. They like to give you, they like to ask this, the nerve to the abductor digiti minimi, the first branch of lateral plantar nerve, goes between the uh, quadratus planti, it has two heads, this is a medial head, and the flexor digitorum brevis on its course. They like to ask which two muscles this nerve tra traverses the hind foot. By the way, it runs right under that heel spur if they've got one. It's interesting to dissect it out. Um, most common uh, complication, medial plantar nerve injury uh, with this procedure. I don't think they're going to ask this, but if you do a partial plantar release with an endoscopic release, you must see the flexor digitorum brevis muscle. That's the FDB, okay? FDB muscle. You must see it or you hadn't done the release you need to do. I don't believe they're going to get into central and you know. Now, uh, diabetic foot. Um, there absolutely, I don't know of any any test that's that that hadn't had this on it. So, um, let me go through some questions that they're almost surely going to ask. How much time have I got? before y'all all fall out of your seats. 20 minutes, 30 minutes? I don't blame you, I wouldn't tell me either. Um, all decisions depend on calcaneal flow. Now what they're looking for is uh, an ischemic index, an ankle uh, brachial index of 0.5 or more. When you get out and practice, make sure it's 0.6 or more. That's what they're looking for here. And they're looking for uh, pulsatile flow tracings means abnormal and not normal triphasic uh, waveforms. The best test, if you don't see ossification on an arteriogram or on a plane film, I mean, of, of vessels all the way out to the toes, if you don't see um, calcification in the media of the vessel, the best test is toe pressure and it needs to be above oh, 40 millimeters of mercury. Good healing, greater than 80%. Uh, transcutaneous oxygen, somewhere in the 30 to 40. In your text, I put 40 millimeters of mercury because I didn't want you to get in trouble with lower. But the literature would indicate 30 to 40, you got an excellent chance to heal. Over 40, you should heal a transmetatarsal amputation. This is how they do it. Now. You, you ought to just look at, the, at Dr. Wagner at Rancho Las Amigas in the orthodiabetic clinic came up with this after extensive, extensive uh, experience with this. Just look through it. It's on page 342, table 510. Um, the bottom line is they want you to breed it till it's a surgically clean, not a bacterial microscopically clean wound, a, a surgically clean wound and then a total contact cast. Remember this. The total contact cast to heal a diabetic plantar ulcer reduces axial load pressure and reduces shear stresses around the ulcer. That's how it works. Axial loading reduced, 
shearing reduced. Now, I, it's about time for them to start asking Jim Brodsky's depth, depth ischemia classification. In my heart of hearts, I don't think it's going to be un, in there. It really doesn't make much difference. Look down here where it says pressure relief. That's because he puts them in a 3D boot instead of a total contact cast. I think I would just stick to the Wagner classification. If they throw it to you, this Brodsky classification, don't let it throw you. Just think Wagner classification. And put some of that up in your mind, particularly stage two and three, because four and five are gangrene. You know you've got to do an amputation, and you just got to know your toe pressures or oxygen tensions. So it's two and three is all you have to really remember in that classification. Now, if they've got an, oh, do y'all remember the in-training exam question in 04, which I don't think they're going to give you? Is an IP joint ulcer and a diabetic, and, and, and the answer was subhalical sesamoid excision. Any of you remember that from 04, in-training exam? Well, that's what it was worth. Not a single one of you remembered. Uh, I don't know where they got that question, but if they've got an IP joint ulcer that's right in the midline, right here, and they show you an AP x-ray, Look carefully through the IP joint and you'll see a little sesamoid bone. They're leading you down the path of a subhalical sesamoid excision. And um, we raised holy cane about that question, so maybe it won't come back again. I don't know about that. But nonetheless, subhalical sesamoid um, in the midline of an ulcer, it might be, might be a choice. What they want, though, what they really want with an IP joint ulceration here is they want a Keller resection. They want to, believe it or not, they want a Keller resection to reduce uh, push-off pressure at the IP joint and then a total contact cast. This is what happens with a total contact cast. I just wanted to give you a visual, stick it in your mind, it'll make you use that because that's what they want. Um, most ulcers beneath the metatarsal head will heal with debridement, um, good blood flow, uh, debridement, TAL, if added to TCC, if they add the choice of a tendo Achilles lengthening with your debris mine and total contact gas, choose it. Because there's just there's so much data, and, and I just think they want you to know that with a TAL, reduced forefoot pressure will heal that ulcer. But you've got to continue the TC, total contact cast uh, and, the, and the, the surgical debris mine. Now, for protective sensibility, what they want you to pick is Sims-Weinstein monofilament 5.07. It's a logarithmic number. It has no units. So it's just 5.07 Sims-Weinstein monofilament screening method for protective sensation. Now, the lab test that's most predictive of a, an ulcer that's present that's, that, you, that you see is the serum albumin level or they might give you pre-albumin level. They might give you that. But serum albumin level. But now, you've got a healed foot with, with loss of sensation and a diabetic patient, and they ask you, what is the greatest risk factor for ulceration in a diabetic foot with neuropathy? And it's a history of a previous plantar diabetic ulcer. Not, not break, you know, not the ischemic index, not their instantaneous oxygen. What they want you to do is this. Previous ulcer is the most predictive uh, sign that there's going to be another ulceration. That foot's at risk for another ulceration. If they ask you how to correct a common deformity after a show part amputation, choose an uh, Achilles tenectomy or a TAL. Both of them will not be answered. Now, Charcot arthropathy, uh, I think you need to look at Eichenholz's uh, definition. Uh, I mean, his classification, page uh, 342, table 510. Um, I, I just think you ought to run through that. Stages 0 to 1 and moving into 2. 1 and 2 are your inflammatory phases. Big old red swollen foot that looks infected that you get called for your consult on. It's not infected. That takes total contact casting, non-weight bearing, until you enter a good, stable second uh, stage. I can hold stage two, which is the coalescent phase. 
Then you can start them weight bearing, but you still have protected weight bearing in a brace or a cast. They want you to know how do I differentiate infection from Charcot changes? Maybe there's no good way to do it. But what you circle is this. What you push is this. Indium label, white blood cell, technesium study, a, 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 a scan, combined with an MRI for specificity and sensitivity. You combine those two. That's what you want you to do. If they don't give you combined with MRI, pick the white blood cell label indium scan. The consolidation phase is stage three. I think you ought to at least look at it, y'all. Um, now, um, I'm, I'm going to mention this because, and I, I'll bet you your trauma people will, but you've got a diabetic patient. They've got a bimalleolar fracture subluxation dislocation of the ankle. They tell you in the, in the question that there's a neuropathy. You still fix the fracture, just like you always would. But you protect them and you protect them and you protect them, and that's where the question is leading you. Four to six months, non-weight bearing, touchdown weight bearing, just extreme, more than you even think. That's what you choose. That's, that's the button that you push. But you go on and fix them. Um, I think that, I don't know if they're adult reconstructive people get to it, but you've got to know the angles to arthrodise your ankle. You, d you just have to know how to do that. that they, they can ask you that. The triple, you've got to know um, where, where to, you know, what position to put that subtalar and mid-tarsal joint in. And remember, if you're in too much hindfoot valgus, it's your deltoid ligament that gives way. And finally, the lateral aspect of your tibio-talar joint. This is the position for your subtalar fusion. Uh, you've got to think of three planes when you do a mid-tarsal arthrodesis. Um, remember this. If you fuse a subtalar joint, you're going to have 50% of your mid-tarsal motion remaining. You fuse just the TN joint, you're going to have 90% of your subtalar motion taken away. If you fuse the CC joint alone, like a lateral column lengthening and a posterior tib insufficiency, you will still have... 70 to 80 percent subtalar motion after a CC fusion. Don't ever arthrodise the fourth and fifth metatarsal and list rank injury. Um, be careful. They, they like to ask about the MTC joint fusion, most common complication, dorsiflexion, transfer metatarsalgia. You've got to know the position of preference for an MTP fusion. Radiographically, it's 20 degrees. From the longitudinal axis, the first metatarsal, longitudinal axis, the phalanx and the lateral view, or to the plantar surface of the foot, the pulp of the hallux with the IP joint in neutral needs to be 10 degrees to the plane from the most prominent part of the forefoot pad and heel pad, and 10 to 15 degrees of valgus. Joint preparation and position, you can have a, they'll, they'll lead you along that path. You can have a fibrous union and a happy patient. You can't have a malunion that's solid with a happy patient. I don't know how much I ought to get into this, y'all, but if they ask you what's the most prominent part, uh, this, this, this uh, plantar medial uh, bony prominence is there in a CVT. That's the head of the talus, by the way. And they love to tell you to get a dorsiflexion lateral x-ray. Um, I know somebody that will tell me to sit down. Y'all wouldn't tell me what time it was. But uh, Dr. Miller's not shy. How much time do I have, Mark? I have 30 minutes? I'm going to wear them out then. I thought I was about through, y'all. I couldn't. All right. Sorry. Take a deep breath. If I get you out five minutes early, will you drink a beer with me? <laughs> they want to leave now, Mark. Um, listen, in Tarsal Coalition, um, frequent sprains... In the adolescent, you know, the soccer player, and they keep tearing up their ankle and coming in, and mama's all upset because they know they're going to play for the University of Colorado. I heard there's a football team out here, but I'm not sure. Perineal spasm, less than a third of the patients. Ball and socket ankles, a ball and socket ankle joint, you've got to think of multiple coalitions. They love to ask this one. They've been asking it 30 years. 
failure of primitive mesenchyme to segment. Um, Non-operative management initially. Um, calcane navicular bar, oblique x-ray, a TC bar, CT scan. They talk about resecting it if it involves less than 50% of the joint. D don't get me into that because it's vague, but nonetheless it'll show up in your, 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 your test, not infrequently, gone and push that you resect it if less than 50% of the joint involved. Nowadays, the PD pies are, are more and more influencing us, and I think the correct answer would be on your exam, and I haven't seen this one now, is they say excessive heel valgus associated with middle facet tarsal coalition. Excessive heel valgus. Then they want you to do, which means a little greater than 10 degrees, they want you to do a uh, uh, closing wedge sliding osteotomy at the calcaneus to correct some of that. Now, they might give you nothing but a weight-bearing lateral x-ray. And they'll tell you this patient has uh, sinus tarsi pain uh, and a tired foot and aching. And you get this x-ray and you see this dorsal beaking. Well, that sort of, you know, that sends your antenna up right there. But what they're looking for here is called a C, this ABC, C sign from a large middle facet tarsal coalition. If they might not even give you a CT scan. That's all they give you. By the way, this is not an indication of severe enough DJD to preclude a medial facet resection. Are you with me now? Dorsal beaking of the talus is not a reason that precludes middle facet coalition resection. Uh, I threw this in here. It's a different plane on both feet. It's not really fair to do it. But what they're getting at is if this middle facet passes way over and, and it looks like more than 50% of the subtalar joint, because you know it overlaps at some, is involved, then, then you, have to, you can't do a, a, a resection. Now, excessive heel valgus you can't correct by an osteotomy or degenerative change in the subtalar joint, do a fusion. This is a subtalar fusion. One side might be symptomatic to go all the way to fusion. Another side might be asymptomatic. It's, 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 a, strange, it's a strange entity. Now, what's vulnerable with the TC middle facet resection? FDL lies right over your incision that you want to take the bone away from. The posterior tib is immediately superior, and the FHL is just beneath the, the ledge of the sustentaculum. All of you know that, but remember, the FDL has to be pulled out of the way, the neurovascular bundle, plantarward. And a CN bar resection, the most uh, common injury is to the lateral branch of the deep perineal nerve. <coughs> and when you get through, in the far depths of your wound, you see a ligament in the depths of the hole of your CN bar. You see a ligament in the base of it. What's that ligament? It's the most lateral aspect of your spring ligament, way over there in the hole. Um, Kohler's disease, always treat it non-operatively. And believe it or not, sometimes they'll throw out an ingrown toenail. Don't do a matrix resection in an adolescent. Do two or three plate resections, partial plate resections. Recurrent infections, okay. Still, don't do a, plate re a matrix, germinal matrix resection. Um, in, in an adolescent. Now these two they seem to love to throw out, uh, and that is rigid club foot in the arthropitic uh, potic patient and in a uh, patient with diastrophic dysplasia. Equine, um, uh, pet, talipes equinovarus, they love that. Now, um, this is a worrisome one, so I threw it in because it's been in there. Uh, leg pain with knee extended, pulse reduced or absent at ankle, and it's called a popliteal artery syndrome. Try to put that somewhere back there. Now, um, I've got a few minutes. I'm not going to talk about OCD because, Mark, aren't, aren't, aren't the athletic people going to talk about OCD of the Taylors? All right. Then just remember two things and that's all. And if Dr. Miller tells you no, it's, it, you believe him, not me. Two things and that's all. Lateral lesions are more commonly traumatic. Lateral lesions as a whole do better than medial lesions.
and the most extensive data that we've got long term still does not throw out uh, drilling and curetting. I'm a little on shaky ground there. Um, you've got to know the Sanders classification of calcaneal fractures. You've got to know Taylor neck fractures, the classification. You've got to know Hawkins sign. It's still around. I mean, he, Dr. Hawkins did us, he did us a great favor with that paper years ago. They like to ask about snowboarder snowboard, fracture. This is always, always an articular fracture. You can't fracture the lateral process of the talus without it being articular uh, fracture. But if it's not big enough to fix, don't fix it. And they'll probably show you a CT scan so you can really get a feel for its size to know whether you've got to fix it or not. Always stabilize the lateral malleus before you fix the posterior malleolar fragment. They like to ask that question. Displaced articular fractures of calcaneus require ORF unless medical or social history makes surgery too risky. Peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, neuropathy, and so forth and so on is listed there. Severely comminuted calcaneal fractures, yeah, I, this is where I don't know what to tell you. Uh, about half the questions will say subtalar arthrodesis, the others will say let it coalesce and do a late reconstruction. I just hope the wording carries you down the path that you want to go, that, that that's the right path. Any displacement of Taylor neck fracture requires fixation, greater than two millimeters. So that's not any, but greater than two millimeters. If a stage, if, if a grade one or type one or stage one Taylor neck fracture, non-displaced, gets avascular necrosis of the body, they're probably going to lead you to the point where there was a spontaneous marked subluxation of the subtalar joint and reduction or the tibiotalar joint and reduction. In other words, you had more of an injury than you think you did. That's where they're going to lead you with the AVN after um, type 1 fracture of the neck of the talus. Hawkins sign is not sclerosis of the talar body. Hawkins sign, the radiolucency at 6 to 8 weeks on an AP x-ray of the uh, dome of the talus, still a good sign of uh, potential revascularization. One test had nothing but a, a, a three month after injury, fixation, fracture had healed, subtalar joint looked in good position, nothing but a weight bearing lateral x ray. And where they were leading you was AVN of the Taylor body was beginning to develop because you could see sclerosis of the body compared to the uh, uh, osteopenia of the distal tibia at the metaphyseal area there, a uh, subchondral uh, area, because he hadn't weight bearing on it in so long. Well, the calcanea, the Taylor body ought to be osteopenic too. D did I say that well enough where y'all can get a feel? You might, have to you might have to diagnose AVN just from a lateral weight bearing x ray from the discrepancy in the metaphysis of the distal tibia. Uh, Subtalar dislocations um, always get a CT scan. They want you to do that. You lose su uh, subtalar motion, usually not plenty significant. With a lateral dislocation, Lateral subtalar dislocation, open dislocations of the subtalar joint are more common laterally than medially. But 85% of subtalar dislocations are medial. If you can't reduce a lateral subtalar dislocation, and some of them are tough. How many of you have had a tough time reducing a lateral subtalar dislocation? You know, where are you out? Well, they're looking for the posterior tibial tendon interposed over the neck of the talus. That's what they're looking for. Uh, Medial dislocation irreducible. They might have perineal tendons. They might have extensive digital and brevis. Um, they might have Taylor head fracture within a position. But what, what they really want and probably will give you is buttonhole through the uh, extensor retinaculum. That's what they, they want. The Taylor head is buttonhole through the retinaculum. Now, we got a, 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 an athlete. He plays for the University of uh, Colorado. Um, He's got vague midfoot pain, no swelling, good motion. Where they're leading you with all of that is to get a bone scan because the plain films are normal and they've got a fracture of their navicular. That's where they're going with this. You treat that non-weight bearing for six to eight weeks. If you get a non-union, you have to uh, put a screw across it and bone graft it. That's what you want to answer. If they don't have bone graft and just screw, we'll pick it. But if they've got bone graft and screw, you've got to do it. If they don't heal in about eight weeks. That's a sagittal plane injury. Um, 
midfoot pain, professional amenorrheic, uh, amenorrheic dancer. Look hard for a stress fracture at the base of the second metatarsal. That's a favorite place because remember they're on point a lot. Um, they might get a navicular stress fracture too, but both won't be listed. Uh, list frank injuries, you've got to know the origin insertion of the list frank ligament. You just, you just got to know it. Uh, metatarsal fracture will always have a figure with it. The border digit, first and fifth, you can be a little more aggressive except in a ballerina. Central uh, metatarsal fractures, leave alone unless there's you know, 20 degrees angulation and you're afraid they're going to get a transfer metatarsalgia. Or if there's 100% um, uh, translation with overriding in a bayonet position. If they look awful, fix them. But make sure they look awful before you recommend fixation for metatarsal fractures unless it's the first or the uh, uh, mark, uh, uh, markedly displaced fifth and it's not a dancer. These turf toes are usually, they can be hyperextension or hyperflexion, but mostly hyperextension is what they're going for. Check the position of the sesamoids. Remember that proximal migration of sesamoids that I gave you earlier? That's an intrinsic minus hallux built into it. That will take a $50,000 game player and put him on the bench. So always check the sesamoids um, in a patient with swollen MTP joint following uh, uh, an athletic injury. Uh, look for an osteochondral injury also. Um, you know, the old, the stress fracture at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction now, you need to go to um, um, page, uh, figure 554 in Miller's textbook, page 354. And it will give you the zones of fracture of a proximal meta fifth metatarsal. The avulsion, the Jones, and the, bre and, the, and the dreaded black line or the, 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 uh, the uh, <coughs> a watershed of the vascular supply, distal and proximal. It will give you all of that and, and, um, and we won't bear on it here. Um, zone three fractures though, that's the bad zone uh, from loss of the nutrient uh, artery. Uh, if there's sclerosis of the, of the fracture site, obliteration of the canal, and conservative management fail, you fix them with a screw and a bone graft. If they don't offer you a bone graft, just screw, pick it. But hopefully they'll offer you bone graft and screw. Um, now, just a moment on this, and, and, and I hope the trauma guys cover it. Do you see this fracture line right here? This is your primary fracture line. This is the anterior edge of the posterior facet. This is the CC joint. The primary fracture line is in a posterior medial direction exiting the medial aspect of the tuberosity calcaneus, and that's what gives you that stable sustentacular fragment that you try to put the tuberosity to. This, the articular, the working end of this fracture that gets the patient in trouble and drives us crazy, is a secondary fracture line. Now, in Sanders classification, one fracture line, now this is a type, uh, a stage two, by the way, two fracture fragments. Um, the... Um, Type 3 are three, uh, two fracture lines and three fragments, and type 4 is comminuted. Type 2 and 3, Sanders classification, closed. Um, there are some um, caveats and disclaimers, in, um, and maybe they'll put that in the questions. I, I don't know. But in the, in the non workman's compensation patient, um, non-systemically um, ill patient, you've got a 70 to 80 percent chance of a good to excellent result in a type 2 or 3 Sanders uh, displaced articular fracture of the calcaneus. That's what they want you to circle, 70 to 80 percent chance of ORIF. Oh, on a lateral x-ray, they might give you what is the, on the single x-ray, what is the best prognostic indicator radiographically that this patient with an articular fracture of the calcaneus is going to do poorly? And what you circle is loss of Burler's angle, 25 to 40 degrees. It's down to zero. Loss of Burler's angle most, is the best prognostic indicator. I 
I hope they don't get into the age thing because there's too much controversy about it. A fellow named Buckley that probably knows more about these fractures than anybody on earth thinks that age does make a difference, but Roy Sanders doesn't. So I'm not going to get into that. But um, age is usually, the older they get, you don't want to operate on them usually. Now, you got a big old swollen foot. What do I hit, Dr. Richard? What button do I hit for compartment syndrome? Well, you do what your attending told you. If you think about it, son, do it. But for this test, you, you, you do multiple compartment pressure measurements over about a 30-minute period. You try to do three or four compartments, and it needs to be 40 millimeters of mercury or higher. And the reason you do them is you don't want ischemic necrosis of your intrinsics and claw toes, or you don't want permanent neuropraxia neuralgia. That's why you do it, for the compartment syndrome. A distraction bone block arthrodesis, if they've got a, a, a loss of their Taylor declination angle on the lateral x-ray, are you with me? Loss of the Taylor declination angle. In other words, the talus and calcaneus longitudinal axis are almost parallel like a cavus foot. They're going to get anterior impingement. So if the, if the Taylor declination angle is less than 20 degrees, put 20 degrees, less than 20 degrees, then they're going to have anterior impingement. You don't want to do a bone block distraction arthrodesis. Restore the normal uh, Taylor declination and lateral talocalcaneal angle. This was a teenager that brought me his, his stirrup. Can you believe it? It's right out of an old French textbook, isn't it? Um, fix list franks, any kind of displacement, you know, just three or four millimeters, fix it. I think they're fixing too many, but don't you circle that on the exam. Um, you can get a, a, a ligamentous injury, probably requires an arthrodesis. In other words, you've got a little flex sign, but no fractures at all. Well, go on and fix that, but that's more prone to give you the flat foot permanently if it's, a, if it's just a ligamentous injury. If you've got some fractures associated with it, fractures bigger than just the flex sign, that's probably going to give you a good arch when you fix it. Either way, you might get degenerative changes at the respective joints. If you line up this one right here, the fourth and the third, cuboid lateral cuneiform on the oblique view is a good indication that your <coughs> at least the lateral column is not involved, the central and lateral columns. Remember, it can propagate through the first web space, I mean the first intermetatarsal space, out between the cuneiforms, dart out between the navicular and cuneiform, and then you've got to fix uh, cuneiforms and fix the uh, cuneiforms to the navicular. Remove the screws at about four months. I would pick as long as you can. Keep them non-weight bearing for about uh, 10 weeks, 12 weeks. I just don't have time to go through all that, so we'll... Um, I think the other, the other team will probably... Uh, stress fractures, uh, high index of suspension, we went over that a little bit and how to treat it, um, the stress fracture from lateral column. Oh, on the orthoses, they might ask you about this. After a transmetatarsal amputation, I think you ought to pick toe filler over a carbon fiber foot plate or a steel rocker. That's what you ought to pick. And why? Because if you can get a full-length rigid plantar uh, shank, you reduce the energy level that you're expending, and it uh, increases your, your uh, stride length. You don't come off the foot as quickly, and so your, your energy expenditure is less. That's what they want you to do. But you've got to have a sub, supple uh, subtalar joint. And remember, you never can post more than five degrees of high foot abnormality. It produces symptoms rather than help them. That's what they want, five degrees and no more. Your best orthoses are those p light PPT things called cross-link polyethylene foam orthosis. It's a blown foam, greatest shock-absorbing properties. UCBL works by controlling hind foot and a flexible deformity. The Sam's prosthesis is unique because it has a suspension mechanism. It, it does not require an auxiliary uh, suspension mechanism. Whenever you write a prescription for a rock or so, you need to put a steel shank in it too. I don't know why they asked this, but they asked this twice. Um, 
sick patient, five days after surgery, systemically ill, sick as a goat, uh, and that's what they want you to think about. Now, the hand people usually put this in, but if it's frostbite of a foot, that's how you warm it up, 104 to 170 degrees. They've got cold feet, blank skin. A common foot condition that I suffer for, from markedly is foot and mouth disease. Y'all been very nice. I can't believe you sat there that long. Thank you. <laughs>